An encounter with a freaking serial killer. Whether it be at the laundry, at your job, or even right next door. Grab a blanket, turn off your lights, and let's play a game. To try to find out the names of these three serial killers, put it in the comments who you think they are. Serial Killer Brothers This is not my story, but that of close family friends who are like my grandparents and will be referred to as such for this story. The year was 1978, well before I was born, so some details may be a bit off. One night, my grandparents were hosting a party. Neighbors and friends came, and the party went on late into the night. Two of the guests, a husband and wife, decided to leave early as they were planning on having people over the next day to celebrate the wife's birthday. The couple goes home, the party continues. The next day, family of this couple shows up for the planned celebration and finds them dead, shot multiple times in a brutal home invasion. Obviously, their family and the entire neighborhood were completely devastated and terrified by this discovery. Months later, their murder is linked to several others that have occurred throughout the year in which the victims were shot with a .22 caliber pistol. Fortunately, one of the creeps committing these crimes wasn't very bright and gets caught and arrested while attempting to use their last victim's credit card. Investigation ensues, and the two men who are brothers confessed and are charged with the murder of my grandparents' neighbors as well as eight other people. That story alone is terrifying, but the creepiest part for me is what my grandparents learned while attending the trial of these disgusting individuals. They confessed that my grandparents, not their neighbors, were their intended target. Having the largest and most secluded home in the neighborhood, the brothers had been to my grandparents' house previously, had watched them, and decided to come back on that night to carry out their plan, not expecting them to be having a party. That night, the night of the party, they stood outside of my grandparents' house watching and waiting for everyone to leave. Apparently, they got tired of this and seized their opportunity when they saw my grandparents' neighbors leaving the party early and walking home on foot and decided to follow them instead. There could be no better ending to this devastating story than those two creeps rotting in jail and I am happy to relay that this is exactly what happened to them. So, .22 caliber serial killer brothers, I'm glad you both rotted to death in jail and never got the chance to meet my grandparents. The Baby Man This isn't my own encounter, but my mother's experience from when she was around 19 to 21 years old. If not fucked reading all of this, basically my mom was almost the victim of a creepy rapist serial killer baby man who preferred to use axes as a signature weapon. Background: She lived alone in a small unit in Richmond, Melbourne and worked night shifts at a restaurant. Because she worked nights, she would sleep during the day and wake up around 2 to 3 p.m. She had a friend who visited her place regularly around the time that she woke up, and they would eat a meal together and hang out for a couple hours. This was a part of my mom's daily routine. Story: One night my mom was at the laundromat, alone, and she noticed a smallish young European or Middle Eastern macho looking man unloading a washing machine full of baby clothes, like a huge amount of baby clothes. To my mom, the whole scene looked out of place, this guy didn't seem right, his demeanor didn't fit the load of baby clothing he was hauling into his basket. The man looked over at my mom, stared at her, but my mom mentioned that she didn't think much about it at the time. She left shortly after with her load and drove back to her unit. A couple weeks later, 
Mom finished her shift at work and drove back to her place, went to bed, woke up the next day in the afternoon, and soon heard a knock at her front door. Assuming it was her friend, she started walking down the hallway where you could see the frosted window at the end. She saw a smallish figure, the exact size as her friend, and didn't have any thoughts that it could be someone other than who she expected. My mom said that when she was halfway down the hallway, her body suddenly stopped in its tracks, and an immediate overwhelming feeling of crippling fear came over her. She was frozen, and staring at the shape of the figure outside for a minute when an unknown voice said something like, Hey, come open the door, it's me. My mom slowly walked back down the hallway and into her bedroom. She waited in her room for the unknown visitor to leave, but he didn't. Every couple of minutes, he would say things like, Come on, let me in. I know you're in there. Why don't you just open the door? According to my mom, she waited in her room for maybe two hours listening to the stranger calling out to her. She couldn't call anyone because the phone was in her kitchen and she didn't have the bravery to leave her room. As the unit was tiny and easily accessible, she was afraid the person outside would hear her and find a way to get inside. She mentioned that, after waiting for so long, she couldn't handle the cold temperature of her room as she was barely wearing anything. She finally got the guts to jump out and bolt from her room to the kitchen, which had a back door. She ran out the back door and down the street behind her unit. She had a neighbor who she was friends with and went straight to their place. She explained what happened and they both looked out this person's window, which had a view of my mom's unit since their street was in a U shape. They could still see the stranger standing at the front of my mom's door. It was the same man from the laundromat a few weeks earlier. They called the police, but the man left before anyone came. After the incident, my mom stayed at her parents' house for a few days. Soon, she felt she was safe to go live in her own unit again. A couple weeks after moving back to her unit, she began receiving notes and letters from under her door and on her front steps. According to my mom, the letters had strange things written on them. She never told me what was written, but she mentioned that the sentences and words were extremely amateur as if written by a six-year-old. Letters were squiggly, written back to front and arranged in strange sequences. My mom would give the notes into the police station. They weren't treated as much of a threat though. This continued for maybe a few weeks or a month. One day, my mom woke up in the afternoon av after a previous night shift. It was just another regular day, but she felt that she needed to go and spend the night at her parents' house. She left, spent the night, and got a call the next day to find that the strange man from the first incident had returned to her unit around the same time she left, made his way to the back of her unit with an axe, and immediately started axing down her back door like a madman. He was seen by a neighbor who called the police. However, the man left before the police came. Anyway, it turned out that the man's description, partnered with the strange notes my mom was receiving, fit the policeman's belief that the man was a suspect of rape and murder of a number of girls in Melbourne from the 1970s onwards. He, was, he wasn't caught, and I don't know if he ever was, he, he's most likely still out there. I found a site that might contain possible murders by the baby man. I also wondered if, if a few of the men around the ages of 56 and over with pedophilia and murder crimes on the site could, could possibly be that baby man. I worked with a serial killer. I tell this story all the time to friends, and I feel it would be a good fit here. As a little background information, at the time these events occurred I was a 22 year old female and had just graduated culinary school. I needed a job and did not want to remain in the city I had finished school in, 
I had a relative that worked in the administration area of the state prison, located in my hometown. Now, due to the nature of this place and my not being entirely sure what the rules are for identifying some people and places, I will have to be a bit vague in my descriptions, and I apologize for that. I will say it was a prison designed originally for high security inmates, but due to the lack of other facilities in the state, the population ended up being a mix of low and high security guys. My relative told me there was an opening in the food production area of the pen as a supervisor. It paid well, had benefits, and would look really good on a resume. I interviewed for the position and was hired and moved back to my hometown. I was pretty much just thrown into the job and spent my first couple months before and during trainings. Officer training, even though I, I would be in the kitchen areas, I still had to go through the same training that COs took, including having to search a cell. It was awful. I worked in the main facility, supervising the inmate workers in the chow hall, escorting them by myself between the different areas of the facility to deliver and pick up chow carts, etc. Just to be clear, in this place, you, you're always on camera, have a radio on your belt, a distress panic button, and all sorts of other security. It was still kind of creepy, though. Once I finished training, I was moved over to the separate facility where the actual cooking and production was done. Food was trucked between it and the main facility at mealtimes. Inmate workers were also transported between the two. As soon as I got there, I started hearing about B. B was a senior guy at the facility amongst the inmates and was a serial killer. At the time, he was in a different state facing charges on what the local authorities believed were several more of his victims after remains were found in the area. Needless to say, I was a bit intrigued. So about a month later, B comes back. I will never forget meeting him for the first time. First off, he's huge, about 6'5", 300 pounds, but not fat, just gigantic hands and feet and ice blue eyes. He was also extremely quiet, polite, and a very hard worker. He was kind of my right hand man and he was very familiar with the facility and had been working the kitchen for years. Most of the guys I worked with were fine and uh, most liked me as I, I was a, a young girl and B made the food taste good. There were several guys in for drug offenses, lifers that just wanted to keep their noses clean and live with as little hassle and as much freedom as possible, and general low threat guys. There were definitely still assholes and creeps, but that's the name of the game I guess. I never really felt threatened. Especially after one afternoon working with B. Another inmate jokingly come behind me and said, Boo! Laughing about how he'd gotten me. He went on his merry way and B came up to me, a very serious look on his face, and said, If anything ever happens here, or someone messes with you, you come find me. I'll take care of you. I was very kind of taken aback, but I hate to say this, flattered at the same time. No one messed with B and most seemed almost in awe of the guy. Some of the stories they told me about him were nuts, so yeah, it kind of felt good to know that he was on my side, I guess. I never, I never felt, felt scared or threatened by B. Until one day, a bit later. B and I were setting up the conveyor area, where we filled and loaded the chow trays for the other facility. We were loading big trays of food onto the cart, when this little asshat called Skeeter started giving me crap. He had only been in the kitchen for a few weeks and had been a total creep and jerk to me from the moment he showed up. I don't remember exactly what he was saying to me, but I was getting pissed and a bit flustered. B was bent over, placing a tray on the cart. When he suddenly stopped, looked up at Skeeter and said in a low voice almost under his breath, Don't start that shit, Skeeter. 
I don't know what it was about how quickly and drastically his demeanor changed, but I unconsciously took a step back. Those crazy blue eyes were focused on Skeeter, and the tone of his voice was so serious and sinister. It scared the crap out of me. Even though Skeeter was a little further away, and I don't think he heard what, B what B said, he just knew something was up too. He went white, mumbled an apology, and hurried off. I was still pulled back, staring at B with my mouth open. And just like that, he smiled, straightened up, and said something along the lines of, Now that's done. What's next? And we went on about our day. I ended up quitting not too long after that. Working in a prison is rough, especially for a female my age. All of the other inmates had told me B was a fantastic artist, and at the time I left, I was told he was working on a drawing for me. I never got it, and that kind of bums me out. I will never forget that day on the line, though. My whole time working there was crazy. But that experience with B was by far the craziest. Sorry if it was long and rambling, but if there's anything that needs clarification, just ask. Thanks.